Hi everyone, I'm Jit from Singapore and my self-care activity is being freshly showered, lying in bed with a little good book to put me to sleep. You're watching The Psych Diaries! Hi, welcome or welcome back to The Psych Diaries. My name's Ro, I'm a clinical psychologist registrar from Sydney, Australia. Today I'm going to talk about how psychologists read minds. This one is just classic. It's the first thing anyone ever asks me when I say that I'm a psychologist and I can understand where that idea comes from. Maybe going to therapy, people have had an experience of thinking like, oh, I never made that link before. You must be reading my mind. But today I'm actually going to explain what psychologists do, what the process is, why it makes it seem like we read minds when we definitely don't. And it's such a joke actually that we had a psychology hoodie that I'll show you, I'll put a photo up of it, but it says like, I can't read minds. So if you're interested in figuring out how psychologists seem to read minds, then keep on watching. So psychologists do a couple of things. If I were to separate them into components, it would be that we do assessment, formulation, diagnosis, and then treatment. And so I'll go through the four stages. The first assessment is that first session where you meet someone or second session where you're just gathering information about what's going on currently, thoughts, feelings, behaviors, cultural environment, social environment, different stresses in people's lives. And then after that, we've got a period called a formulation period. And that's where we actually piece together all the missing links. Based on what type of therapy you do, you have a different style of formulation, but I primarily do a CBT or like schema kind of formulation. The way that I do it is we look at someone's history, so a combination of their kind of genetic background as well as historical events, things that maybe happened a bit earlier on during those formative years. And so you've kind of got your history and then you've got core beliefs. And core beliefs I really like to describe as ways that we see the world. And so I think of them as like a pair of glasses. And often core beliefs are really quite uh, stubborn and stuck. And once we develop them, they're quite hard to shift. An example of a core belief could be that if someone was growing up and they got sick a lot, uh, like really, really often compared to their peers, maybe they had severe allergies or um, they had some sort of health condition, they might grow up with a core belief, you know, I'm vulnerable to harm or weaker than other people around me. Based on our early experiences, uh, basically our environment, we develop certain core beliefs about ourselves, about other people and about the world. Core beliefs can also be really helpful and uh, adaptive. So people might have core beliefs like, People are generally kind or, you know, it's good to ask for help or the world is a safe place. However, sometimes people also develop maladaptive core beliefs and those are ones that aren't so helpful. And if we hold them too strongly, they may impact us negatively in the future. And those core beliefs might be that people aren't to be trusted. There's something wrong with me. Um, I'm unlovable or defective or you know, the world is a dangerous place. I can't let myself rely on anyone else. We think about the current stresses and what's going on in their life. And then we actually create like this, well, I do like a diagram, <laughs> I actually draw all of this stuff out. And then we start making links between their thoughts, their feelings, their behaviors, and how it kind of makes sense in the context of someone having that type of history with those types of core beliefs. And so just like a really quick example, if someone presents with social anxiety, they might come and all they know is that when they go out and do speeches or when they go to school, they just feel this intense sense of dread. They feel really, really anxious and they avoid it. And maybe that's the level of awareness that people have at that point. And so when they come into the psychologist's office, we might ask a bit about the history and it would kind of make sense that maybe someone with social anxiety might have had, might be a little bit more sensitive personality wise. And so they feel the full breadth of emotions. Maybe there's a little bit of a genetic history of anxiety, or maybe they had a couple of experiences when they were younger of being bullied or feeling a bit left out or maybe experiencing other people being left out for certain mistakes. Potentially they might have had carers or role models be quite concerned about what people thought and so that's kind of modeled in the way that we think and what we attune to. I might piece together the fact that someone is probably going to have thoughts of, you know, other people don't like me. Uh, you know, I need to bring something to the table for other people to like me, or I need to impress them. You know, if people knew me, they wouldn't like me. 
a psychologist might seem to be able to like read your mind, but really they fit under a certain theme because we know that the social anxiety model has a certain set of associated beliefs, feelings and behaviors, and, and then also an etiology, which is basically like, these are the risk factors in early childhood or adolescence that could lead to a higher likelihood of the development of a particular disorder. And so this is a really big part of the master's program. It's just learning about all the different types of mental health disorders, learning about the etiology or the history, and also learning common patterns that you see. And so the idea is that we've kind of got this template of what could be going on and then when clients come in we start filling in the gaps a really nice way that i like to think about it is like a flow chart and this is kind of onto that diagnosis stage that i was talking about so for instance if someone comes to the session and says that i'm experiencing sleep difficulties i've already got a couple of little theories in my head you know i wonder if it's a low mood depressive type of sleep difficulty i wonder if it's an anxiety worry ruminative type of sleep difficulty i wonder if it's more related to bipolar disorder Disorder and like a manic phase and all we're even starting to think about is a like a sleep disorder or a physical cause for difficulty with sleep like lethargy maybe like low iron or something and so as soon as someone gives me a certain symptom I have kind of options and then as they give me more information I start cutting cutting stuff out so for instance if they don't display any types of manic symptoms, I start cutting out the idea of bipolar disorder. And we slowly kind of go down the flow chart until we kind of come down to one formulation or one idea or one hypothesis for what could be going on for the client. And then the final stage is we do the treatment for it. And again, our training uh, is about all the different types of therapies and how we can treat different types of mental health disorders. And so long story short, the reasons that psychologists can seem to read minds is because we actually have these models in our minds of what the different patterns could look like, how nature and nurture combine to form different types of mental health disorders. Even if people give us little bits of the puzzle, we can kind of infer the other parts of it. And so that's why when a psychologist pulls out some random tidbit about you, um, it's probably because of pattern recognition or inference rather than anything to do with their ability to read your body language in the session. <laughs> I personally have no, no clue. And the truth is that if someone sits down and they just blatantly lie about all of their history and um, maybe, maybe they don't feel comfortable if it's not a blatant lie type of thing, I don't have all the puzzle pieces for our formulation. I can't really tell if someone's lying. Like I might get a sense over time if I get used to the person. Really, if you come in and tell me some, a whole different history and you tell me a whole different set of thoughts than you really have, then I'm probably gonna struggle <laughs> to, to, to understand. Thank you guys so much for watching as always. It's so lovely knowing there's such a big community of people who love psychology and want to learn more about it. Um, if you'd like to join me for a bit more, I have an Instagram, come follow me. Uh, it's at underscore the psych diaries. And sometimes I post stuff at the clinic about what's going on during the day. I probably most important is I ask questions about what types of YouTube videos you'd like to see. Or if I ever do a Q and A video, I always post polls over there so you guys can send in questions and that kind of thing. Alrighty. Well, I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you very soon. Bye.